Hey everyone, welcome back to Into the Breach 101. This is my series where I'm trying to teach you how to master the game. Whether that means getting more 30k victories, doing challenge runs, just improving your play, anything along those lines. I hope you find these guides instructional and useful. Let's get started. Today's episode is all about weapons and the optimal approaches to selecting them. I'm going to break this video up into two parts, starting with understanding the roles weapons play and then moving into synergizing your squad. Now, one thing to note is that the weapons I'm talking about include all of the systems, including the defensive and passive ones. This is because Into the Breach can easily reward defensive play over offensive play. It all depends on the scenario you're dealing with and what tools you have. Every mech only gets two weapons, and you can only use one of them per turn, generally speaking, so getting a 30k can end up being very difficult if you're going only for damage weapons, but happen to have mediocre ones or ones that don't synergize well over a more tactically useful defensive weapon. Weapons seem pretty straightforward at first, but there ends up being a surprising amount of nuance in the game. You realize that if you switch up the hard difficulty, and come to the conclusion that you simply cannot do enough damage to everything to clear the board if you go into it with a, say, DPS mentality. Uh, that gets really tricky later on when you start experimenting with different squads and different weapons because virtually every weapon is unique in some way. This is contrasted to, say, like an RPG where you might have five different variants of a spear that pretty much all do the same thing, just at a different magnitude. Now, given that there are about 70 different weapons in the game on top of about 14 different passive components, it can be really overwhelming to get a handle on the optimal combinations. And since your choice of those weapons can be very RNG driven, you need a way to more quickly identify which systems synergize well and which don't outside of their unique quirks. We're going to do that by breaking down synergy to a simple mental grid. We're going to start by lumping the things a weapon can do into a few generic categories and go from there. So on a given turn, a weapon can more or less do one or more of the following. Damage an object, move an object, which includes pushing, pulling, teleporting, all of that. And then lastly, applying an effect to an object like acid, fire, smoke, frozen, shielded, and so on. I say object because for the most part, the effects can apply to anything, whether that's VEC, non-VEC enemies, your own mechs, grid building, special objects, NPCs, etc. So if a weapon says it freezes the target, that target could be just about anything. But anyway, in that long laundry list of effects we just went over, it's overwhelmingly the case that a weapon does at least two of them, and often more. And upgrading a weapon can not only change the magnitude of those effects, but then add new ones on top of it. That said, it would be really, really difficult to try and remember what unique effects every weapon has. So instead, we're going to just expand our grid a little bit and add more nuance to those categories to draw a clear picture of the role a weapon fills, regardless of whether or not you've upgraded it. Damage really only needs two branches, low and high, and that's a bit subjective because it's relative to what stage in the game you're on, that on Island 1, right, two damage is going to be high, but then by the time you reach Island 3, two damage is going to be considered low. But it's still useful for us to know where a weapon falls in terms of its damage output. Moving an object is a little more complex because there's a bunch of different ways to move things, but the important ones are going to be pull or push. We've also got throw, which is kind of a pull, and flipping, which is kind of neither, but eh. It's also important to note that whether you're pushing or pulling is relative. It depends on the weapon you're using and where you're using it from. Like, target is strike, right? And move a VEC in any direction you choose, and so we can qualify it for both pushing and pulling, even though the mechanical action itself is a push. And then uh, the unique teleport is sort of a pull, push, and throw lumped all together. And to make the visualization easy, we'll focus on push and pull, and then combine the two if a weapon can sort of do both. Lastly, we got our status effects, and this is where it gets a little weird, because none of the status effects are really alike. The loosest category I like to put them in is whether they offer a hard counter to a vec action, or whether they offer a soft counter. And so in that case, Smoke and Frozen are hard counters because they outright block a VEC from taking an action. Fire is a soft counter because it doesn't prevent a VEC from doing anything, but they will avoid walking on fire where they can. 
And then Acid and Shielded are even trickier to categorize because Acid itself isn't a hard or a soft counter. It's strictly a support status. And Shielded can't outright prevent a VEC action at all, but it can make that action meaningless. So it's sort of in between a hard and soft counter depending on context. Ultimately, though, for our mental grid, we're going to call this just hard or soft counters. Okay, so now that we got our grid, let's add another row to the bottom to track two other important properties, range and area of effect. Now, range is a, both a property of the mech and the weapon, but it's an important consideration. And then area effect is just that, right? Whether the weapon impacts multiple tiles or just one. And AOE is kind of like statuses in that it's all over the place. It's not consistently applied across weapons. So understanding the applications of a weapon's AOE really requires that you have experience with that weapon. We add it here, but it's important to note that when looking for synergies, we tend to want something that isn't an area of effect to complement a weapon that is and vice versa. This is to help give you flexibility. The end result of that is a two by four grid of the possible roles that a weapon can fill, or at least the roles that we really care about. And so when you find a weapon in a pod or buy one, we want to mentally fill this grid out and consider that when we look at the entire squad, the goal is to have as many of these boxes checked off as we can. Again, with an exception when it comes to AOE. And let's look at some weapons side by side now to show you an example. First, the Rock Accelerator on the Blitzkrieg Boulder Mech. It starts out as high damage and can receive an upgrade. So we'll check off both low and high damage for it. It's got a push effect on tiles adjacent to the target. So we'll check off push and AOE. And then lastly, it's an artillery weapon, so it's long range. This checks off five of the boxes in our grid. Next, we got the Flamethrower from the Flame Mech on my favorite squad, the Behemoths. Now, its effective damage can be quite high due to the stacking of a push and fire, but it really can only deal two direct damage itself, and that's situational, which places it pretty firmly in the low damage column. We'll check off a push attack as well, and it generates fire, so that's a status effect. And lastly, it does have a bit of an AoE. That checks off four boxes, but most importantly, it really only fills out one box, the rock accelerator didn't which kind of gives you a hint that it probably doesn't synergize very well with that but more on that later now for the sake of balance the last weapon is going to be a science weapon so we're going to grab the grav well from gravity mech and i have always felt that gravity mech is a, is a bit underwhelming and the grav well along with it but we're still going to rank it in here for fairness now it doesn't deal any direct damage itself so no checks there and it's a pull weapon which is nice and it's not only long range, but artillery, so it can reach over obstacles. Still, though, it only checks off two boxes. Okay, so take a look at these weapons side by side. Individually, we can see what each weapon is kind of supposed to do, and then get a sense of whether or not they would complement each other. This is a really rapid way to sort any weapon you come across. You mentally add up the checks it provides, and see how that overlaps with the checks you've got already. And generally speaking, the more checks, the better. And also, again, generally speaking, the more diverse the checks are, the better. Now we'll get into part two, where we're going to focus on weapon-specific synergies and how to integrate them into your squad. Now, one cool motif in the game is that every squad tries to set a theme. You know, flame behemoths want to burn and teleport things, frozen titans want to freeze things, etc., etc. And it is totally true that out of the box, you could theoretically beat the game using stock weapons only and get 30k every time. That's a lot easier said than done. On the flip side of that, you could go down the route of ripping out the stock weapons and putting whatever you please on, but the weapons you find are totally RNG, right? You never know what you're going to get in advance. And, you know, it kind of breaks the spirit of the game. So for this video, we're going to assume that you mostly want to keep your squad's stock weapons and try and build a path to success from that. To start, we're going to pick a squad and fill out that mental grid for their starting weapons. Our example squad is going to be one I find a bit underwhelming, and that's Zenith Guard. We've got a prime mech with the burst beam, the brute with the ramming engines, and then lastly, the science mech with the oh-so-great attraction pulse and the shield projector. If you watched my 30k video with them, you'll know that I think they're kind of so-so all around, and the science mech is probably the worst science mech in the game, but I'm going to show you how to break them down and improve them. 
First up, Laser Mech is high damage and long range, along with being AoE because it covers multiple tiles, so that's four boxes checked. Charge Mech follows him. Fairly damaging push attack, but one that comes at the cost of self-damage. In another video, we can go over pilot synergies and how pilot strategies can help fill in those holes. But for now, we see Charge Mech fills up four of the boxes. And then lastly, the Defense Mech, which, as I said before, he really is the weakest in the bunch. He's got no damage outputs, nothing there, uh, but he can pull a long range, which is nice. And the Shield Protector gives us a pretty substantial soft CC that is also area effect. Put all this side by side, and what conclusions can we draw? Well, the squad has two high damage weapons. It's got a push attack and a pull attack, and it has a soft CC that's ranged. And as I said before, the goal for synergizing is to fill out these boxes squad wide and then also on individual mechs. So we can clearly see that the high value items we want to look out for in Zenith Guard are going to be ones that offer a hard CC and then an additional push or pull. Now let's break that down on individual mechs. For Laser Mech, he does a lot of damage and also in a huge AoE, but his lack of a push or pull attack and the lack of an attack that isn't an AoE is what's holding him back. So, high value weapon for the Laser Mech would be something that's a prime weapon that can push or pull targets and isn't an AoE. The good news is for him, there is a number of prime weapons that fall into that category. We've got Titan Fist and Prime Spear as obvious wins. Uh, Prime Spear is a bit of an AoE, but it's more controllable. Hydraulic Legs and Vortex Fist would be useful, maybe a little more niche. And then for the non-Prime weapons, uh, Boosters would check off both Push and Pull, but the lack of upgrades and damage make them not as desirable, but still definitely a contender. Charge Mech, now he's got excellent damage and his attack is also long range and it's push, really, really powerful. And it's perfect for a brute. Now his best complement though is gonna be something that is useful when damage and range uh, isn't. So for him, we want something that offers a hard or soft CC and preferably is an AoE. Now, sadly, there's not a lot of brute weapons to choose from that fit those. Aerial bombs are really the only thing that kind of slots in nicely there. And that's because that most brute weapons focus on damage output. So much more so than laser mech, charge mech is going to want to leverage those generic weapons. And the good news is he's got a lot of choice there. Smoke bombs, ice generator, targeted strike, smoke drop, and so on. All of those help fill out those boxes and give us some sort of hard CC. On to defense mech. Here it gets tricky because he's already got two weapons. The shield generator takes a bit of energy to get going, but the CC it offers is useful, especially toward the end game. And frequently I find with defense mech, I find myself doing nothing but spamming at shields. There might be one turn where I don't, but you know that could also be a sign of defensive play. Still, the shield generator is probably the best part about him. So if I'm gonna change things, I'm gonna dump the attraction pulse. And if we do that, how do we fill him out better? Well, just apply the same logic we've been applying before. Let's try to fill out those damage boxes on him and hopefully something that can replace the loss of a pull. Now, unfortunately, most science weapons don't offer damage, but any one of teleporter, acid projector, fire beam, frost beam, and so on are going to be much more useful than attraction pulse. None of them bump up the damage, you know, minus using the teleporter to drop enemies, but let's instead focus on generic weapons because this is a case where generic damage weapons, which normally they're a bit mediocre, but here they're great for defense mech because, you know, what choice does he have? The deployable light tank is the standout choice in this case, and when you find it, you know, Missile Barrage might also actually come in handy. You know, I would favor a tank over Missile Barrage, but still, it does offer that damage check. And uh, Smoke Bombs or Boosters would be a solid choice here as well. Um, as you get to Island 3 and onward, the Defense Mech becomes a great candidate for a plus one reactor pilot and then slotting in a cross-class weapon. Uh, the point of that all being filling out damage boxes for him is a little bit more difficult and certainly takes more investment and will likely come after you've already flushed out the other two. Looking back at our squad and review, what do we see? Well, Laser Mech has a number of interesting choices and you're very likely to find at least one of them. 
The charge mech is going to be very easy to fill out. He's got a huge list of weapons that complement him well. And defense mech, not as easy, right? But probably just about any science weapon is going to be better than that attraction pulse. And he's also a great candidate for those normally underutilized damaging generic weapons because getting any damage on him can be helpful. Now, let's forecast a bit with the squad and imagine that we say got boosters on the laser mech, smoke drop on the charge mech, and then a light tank on defense mech. Boosters and smoke drop don't require any power. That's great because they help make up with the fact that light tank is so greedy on cores. Now, individually, these weapons don't seem very powerful, right? Particularly the boosters and the smoke drop, where neither of them do any damage, and smoke drop can only be used once per map. But let's look back on how much more flushed out that makes our squad look. All three of these mechs are now capable of pushing or pulling. All three mechs can now put damage, and two of the three mechs offer us a CC of some kind. In mission, the potency of this seemingly innocuous combination will be really obvious. Your laser mech can choose between lining up for a devastating AoE or repositioning himself anywhere on the map while also pushing Vec. The charge mech can use a powerful crush attack if needed, but if crowd control is more important, he can say move to block and then drop smoke along the way. And defense mech can choose between protecting targets with his shield CC or he can deploy his light tank at any range, which both gives you push and damage in the process. You'll see the point I'm trying to make is that we don't care nearly as much about what the damage output or specific features of a weapon system are. We really only care about what flexibility options that weapon adds. Now that about sums up my philosophy on choosing weapons in the game. And with that, we can wrap this video up. I hope you found this enjoyable, and if not that, at least a little bit informational. Um, in any case, feel free to offer suggestions or criticisms or ask any questions below, and I will see you all next time.